Professor Kimchok on topology and strong game. Okay, so thank you very much. This is the second part of this discussion about uh, the correlation and topology in quantum materials. So this was my uh, outline, and I think I covered most of the important topics that I wanted to say last time. So now I'm going to switch, switch the gear. Uh, so in the previous example of particle E day, I was mostly uh, talking about the band topology, essentially thinking about things like topological insulators, five semi-metals. Those are uh, essentially property of the band topology, topology of the band structure. Now for, uh, and, and those, those phases were the examples of some kind of symmetry protected uh, topological phase. So on the other hand, the quantum spin liquid state I'm going to talk about today is an example of intrinsic topological order, topological phase, just like a um, quantum whole state. So you can take that as an example of intrinsic topological phase, so matter. Uh, and I mean, we'll, you, got, you guys will have a more extensive discussion about the spin liquid from uh, a Professor Hide Takak's lectures tomorrow. So I think my job is just to give you some enough theoretical background so that you can enjoy uh, uh, Professor Takagi's lecture tomorrow. So that's basically what I'm going to aim at. Okay. So, uh, so there are many classes of uh, spin liquid materials, but today I just want to focus on uh, only one class of system. Uh, and one of the most famous one is this honeycomb iridae. Uh, so this class of material has this, this chemical formula. So A is, A is some alkali ions, like a sodium or lithium. And in this material, uh, the iridium uh, four plus ion that makes up this famous uh, pseudo spin half degree of freedom, they are sitting on a honeycomb lattice. And alkali ions are actually sitting at the center uh, of the hexa each hexagon. An important thing in this, in, this, in this class of material is that the oxygen octahedra around the idium ions are sharing the edge. So under this condition, uh, uh, these gentlemen, uh, uh, George Jekyll and Ginya Kalugin, uh, they show that uh, if, it, if, you, if you start from this uh, pseudo spin half degree of freedom, remember that that was obtained as a consequence of strong spin orbit coupling in idium ions, uh, then you can end up with the interesting spin model. And here, uh, the spin model is essentially a uh, bond-dependent Ising interaction. So for example, depending on the bond direction, either red, blue, or a green direction, for example, along the blue direction, you only have an Ising interaction along, say, x component of spin. But, but in the other bond direction, you get a different, different kinds of Ising interaction. And the reason why this model is interesting is that if you look at this model, uh, then, then try to solve this model classically. Let's don't think about the quantum mechanical model yet. If you try to solve this model classically, then you will end up with exponentially large number of equally unhappy classical spin configuration. What that means is that the system is extremely frustrated. There's a macroscopic number of uh, degenerate classical spin configuration. Um, so in this situation, uh, the question is, what happens if you include the quantum fluctuation? And that problem was solved uh, beautifully by, uh, by Kitae. So that's why this type of bond-dependent interaction is called Kitae interaction. So this model, this bond-dependent IG interaction, this Hamiltonian, uh, this model can be solved exactly, and this is uh, really a, a very small number of uh, models that we can actually solve exactly. And this is actually the dumb model uh, that can be solved uh, analytically. So Gitaev solved this model as follows, and, and he showed that the ground state of this model is a quantum spin liquid state. So he decided that it's useful to represent spin operator as a product of uh, uh, Mayana fermions. So for example, for x, y, z component of spin, you use uh, one of these Mayana fermions, then, then you multiply that by another Mayana fermion. So if you're not familiar with the Mayana fermion, what that means is that 
the, the, these are the fermionic operators in the sense that they satisfy anti-commutation relation. But if you take the uh, Hermitian conjugate or C dagger, then that's essentially the same as uh, uh, itself. So, so in that sense, you can think about that as some kind of real fermion. Uh, in contrast to the ordinary fermion, that's sometimes called complex fermion. And it's just the C dagger equals to C. So in that sense, it's a real fermion. And those fermions are called Magrana fermions. So that's all you need to know. And, but in order to uh, satisfy spin commutation relation with this, uh, with this kind of strange form, you actually have to impose a, impose a constraint that the product of all these operators actually has to be one. So there's some kind of um, constraint on the, on the, on the this Magrana fermion degree of freedom. But if you do so, then you can solve this problem exactly. And the way you solve this is, is, is very simple. Basically, notice that if I put this representation here, then each spin operates a bilinear in Magrana fermions. So usually, this kind of spin-spin interaction becomes four fermion interaction. And normally, we cannot solve that exactly. But here, one can show that this combination of Magrana fermion operator actually commute with the Hamiltonian. So what that means is that I can take that as a number, a C number, a complex number. And by the time you decide that this is just a number, not an operator, then this Hamiltonian is quadratic. So, and, and, and what they, so it becomes a free fermion problem. And you know, essentially, we are all trained to solve a free particle problem, right? So, so we can solve this model it's just because it's quadratic. Uh, the only uh, 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 subtlety is that uh, not every choice of uh, a number for this, this combination of operator, now it's a C number, uh, is distinct uh, uh, choices. So, so it turns out that a better quantity to look at is the product of these operators along, the hex, along the, uh, uh, this hexagon. So it basically there are six bonds. You think about a loop product of this oper operator. And it turns out that this one also commute with the Hamiltonian. And one can show that the eigenvalue of this operator has to be either plus one or minus one. So there are a number of choices of UIJ that will give you the same uh, eigenvalue of WP. And those are all equivalent configurations. So they don't, they don't represent a different physical state. They actually represent the same state. So uh, you can think of that as some kind of gauge degree of freedom. But nonetheless, by the time you can make a choice here, I think I can solve a free particle problem. And it turns out that for the honeycomb lattice, the, the, the choice for the grounds is very simple. You just take all uij to be plus one, as simple as that. So if you do that, then you can solve this uh, uh, quadratic uh, uh, problem. And then uh, essentially your C minor fermion becomes your quadratic particle. And just like the uh, case in graphene, two-dimensional graphene, you get a Dirac, form, Dirac dispersion at the K point in the brilliant zone. So, so this is the, the ground is a quantum spin liquid. Uh, it doesn't break, it doesn't uh, uh, break translational symmetry, and there's no magnetic order. But you have an interesting uh, uh, quasi particle, uh, quasi particle excitation in your system. Those are the uh, Dirac minor fermion. Okay. So by this time, you may wonder what's the connection between, say, this minor fermion construction and uh, the spin liquid construction that I told you about yesterday. Do you still remember that? I told you that spin liquid is essentially a projected version of the superconductor. I started with a superconductor, then I explicitly constructed uh, the spin liquid wave function. Now here, looks like there is no connection to superconductor, right? The question is, uh, what's the connection between this picture and the picture that I presented yesterday? So here is the connection. So it turns out that you can actually make a, a following unitary transformation. So what, what you do, is you take a, a linear combination of uh, a two of the Mariana fermion, another combination of Mariana fermion, then call that uh, some fermion uh, with upspin, some fermion with a downspin. Just uh, rewriting the you know, uh, operators, right? So instead of using this, uh, instead of using this four Majorana fermion, I'm using two complex fermion, two, two ordinary fermion. And if you do that, then you can show that this representation of spin, uh, namely 
my, in my own representation, spin operator looks like this with this constraint that you can rewrite this like that. So, so now, now a spin operator can be written uh, in terms of this F fermion operator like that. And the constraint on the Majorana fermion now becomes this constraint, namely that the number of fermions per site is exactly one. Now what happens to uh, Kitai Hamiltonian is something like this. Uh, one can show that that Hamiltonian looks exactly like a PCS superconductor Hamiltonian. So he's a hopping term, he's a pairing term. It's just that it's not a spin singly pairing, it's actually a spin triply pairing. And also, because of the fact that original Kitai model has a bond dependent interaction, the pairing, pairing uh, amplitude or the, uh, the structure of the pairing, triply pairing in X, Y, Z bond, they are actually different. So, in terms of, say, I think, you know, you, you learned about D vector in triply superconductor, right, from previous lectures. If you like, the D vector for a different bond direction is different in this type of. Um, uh, spin triple superconductor. So notice that this is essentially a PCS form, but I have this strong constraint, the number of particles is exactly one. That's why ground state of this model is not a superconductor. The ground state of this model is actually insulator because I have this uh, exactly one particle per side constraint. Remember that? Yeah. So that connection exists here. So even though it's written differently, uh, you see that one can still think about this guitar spin ground set as a projected uh, triple superconductor. So uh, often uh, in the literature you encounter terminology like U1 spin liquid and G2 spin liquid. So the idea is as follows. Imagine that I had a Hamiltonian like this, but imagine that there was no pairing term in your Hamiltonian. It's just a, then it becomes just free particle-like problem with this constraint. And in that case, you can easily convince yourself that I can do the following uh, phase transformation for fermion operator, and for the for the hopping amplitude, I can make a, some uh, 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 you know some uh, some kind of gauge transformation like this. Uh, if you assume that this matrix element is a magnitude and phase, so and 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 this this Hamiltonian is invariant under this type of phase transformation and this type of. Uh, uh, phase transformation for the phase. And this is exactly like uh, uh, U1 gauge transformation in, in, in electromagnetism. This is essentially A plus gradient setup, right? So in that sense, uh, this Hamiltonian will be invariant under U1 gauge transformation like this. So whenever you encounter a situation like that, then this type of spin liquid is called U1 spin liquid, which there is no pairing term. On the other hand, uh, in the case of Kitai spin liquid, uh, pairing is always present, so in that, so now, now the Hamiltonian is not invariant under this type of U1 transformation. In fact, it's invariant only under some discrete transformation, namely that uh, you can change the sign of this fermionic operator. You can, you can uh, think about the uh, corresponding sign changes for hopping and, hopping and pairing, and, and, and the, the Hamiltonian is, Hamiltonian is uh, 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 invariant under that sign transformation. So that's why it's called uh, Z2 uh, spin liquid, but sometimes it's called the uh, Ising gauge theory. Yeah? Yes, sir? Yeah. At, at, at this point, this is just an index. Yeah. But if you look at, look, if you look at this, if you look at this representation, then you can see that you can clearly, uh, uh, you can clearly identify this as uh, some kind of spin projection upper, spin projection. Yeah. But this representation is not unique. Another question? Yeah. Could you say it? Where does the, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, the, for the Kitai model, for the Kitai model, uh, maybe I didn't emphasize this clearly, that for the Kitai spin liquid, this UIJ is uh, uh, some number, not an operator. That's why I could solve this model exactly. Yeah? Okay. Now imagine that. Imagine that I start from this model, 
And instead of using my other representation, I just decide to use this representation. Yeah, a lot of people will do that, right? Then you end up with this model like that. But you see, the beauty of the guitar uh, spin liquid is that in the guitar model, both pairing and uh, the pairing and uh, hoping amplitude, those guys again becomes a C number. So that it becomes a quadratic problem. If I take an arbitrary spin model, imagine that you cook up some model, give it to me, and you ask me to solve it, then I can, I can uh, do some kind of mean field theory like this, but I know that this combination of operator is not a C number. And I have to make an approximation. But in Kitai spin liquid, your approximation becomes exact, if you like. So if you like, in Kitai spin liquid, your mean field theory becomes exact. And that's why it's solvable. Yeah? OK. So you know, it's, on, it's by construction. That's right. So, if you, so the question was, uh, the question was in the original Kitai model, there was a, a gapless, uh, there's a gapless uh, 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 Dirac fermion, and the, quest, the question is whether we can still see that here. Yet the answer is yes. If you diagonalize this, if you diagonalize this Hamiltonian using usual Boilbo transformation, then that Boilbo quadrant particles essentially have the same dispersion. You see the same particle. Yeah. OK. So, so that, is, that, is, that is the connection. OK. So now, uh, uh, but that's just a model. That's just a model. And you could add other interactions to the uh, guitar model. Like uh, here, uh, uh, you know, basically they were adding uh, Heisenberg interaction and asking how stable the guitar spin liquid is, right? So if Kitayev spin liquid is so fragile, say if I add an arbitrary additional interaction, if it's immediately destroyed, then we have no chance to see it in the real material. So you want to see some stability. So here, they demonstrated that if they add a Heisenberg interaction like that uh, to a Kitayev interaction, then indeed, uh, there's a finite region in the phase diagram where the Kitayev spin liquid is stable. So it doesn't immediately become unstable. Eventually, if uh, Heisenberg interaction is very, very large, then you can get into a uh, magnetic order state. For example, if Heisenberg interaction, anti ferromagnetic Heisenberg interaction on the honeycomb lattice is a dominant interaction, then obviously you will just end up with a nail anti ferromagnet, just up, down, up, down, spin configuration. It turns out that if, if the strengths of two terms are comparable, then, then you have a, some kind of compromise state. That's what people call a stripey anti ferromagnet so, so in principle, but main message here is that quantum spin liquid can be robust to a small Heisenberg interaction. And in fact, uh, this, you, you don't even have to do this calculation. Uh, if you remember that there were actually gapless uh, elementary excitations in the guitar spin liquid, then, uh, then you realize that what it means is that the density of state of this quasi particles goes to zero, the zero energy limit. And because of that, any short range interaction between my and fermion uh, will be an irrelevant perturbation in the renormalization group sense. So we know from renormalization group argument that this spin liquid cannot be uh, immediately unstable. And, and this computation clearly shows that. So, uh, so at the beginning, uh, people thought that this may be a good model for the sodium iridate or the lithium iridate, the material that I talked about, the honeycomb iridate. So you may, you know, so uh, maybe, maybe you may get excited to see either spin liquid, or if you find the stripy antiferromagnet, you could, you could have claimed that uh, uh, you are actually pretty close to the spin liquid ground state. Yeah, even if you don't get into this phase, if you discover this phase, you may have claimed that, ah, oh, okay, you know, I could have been I could have been there, for example, right? Things like that. But people did the experiment, and, it, and people found that uh, none of these things actually happens. 
this is, this is one of those things that theorists theory predict something, but experimenters discover something else, right? So, so uh, there was a scattering experiment on sodium methane, and they found that magnetic order is not any one of these. In fact, they found the zigzag magnetic order. So this zigzag magnetic order, if you look at it very closely, uh, is different from uh, stripy antiferromagnet. So quite frankly, I have never understood why this is called stripe, this is called zigzag. This one looks also striped to me, but uh, it depends on how you look at it, right? But they are different magnetic order. Okay, so now the question is, why this happens? Why, why uh, this, such a prediction doesn't agree with the experiment? So it turns out that the, the real spin model uh, is much more complicated, and, and I'm gonna explain why. So, uh, so it would be really nice if uh, Kitab interaction is the only spin-spin interaction I have in, in this material. It turns out that if you try to write down the most general exchange model on the honeycomb lattice, uh, say, but imagine that you only want to take into account nearest neighbor interaction, then this is the most general form. Okay, so in principle, all of these terms are allowed. So this is the usual Heisenberg interaction, the Kitab interaction. This is what we call a symmetric anisotropic interaction. Um, so to be more explicit, uh, the structure of this interaction looks like this. So for example, if you look at the X bond, remember that Kitab interaction had this Ising interaction along the X direction. This additional interaction has an off diagonal matrix element. For the X bond, I have YZ, ZY. For the Y bond, I have Z, ZX and XZ, et cetera, et cetera. So the index is basically staggering. It has to, it has to be off diagonal. And if this sign was negative, then this interaction could have been a jalochinsky moria interaction that you are familiar with. It turns out that on this lattice, uh, the jalochinsky moria is not, actually not allowed because there's an uh, inversion center at the bone. So, but you allow this symmetric combination. You don't allow anti-symmetric combination. Okay, good. So, okay, uh, right. Okay, so, I'm gonna uh, uh, sort of sketch the derivation of this model because it was, it doesn't really exist in the literature. So, so I'd like to show you how this general model may be derived. So in order to, in order to think about spin exchange uh, interaction between say two iridium local moments sitting, sitting at, at two nearby sites. So I'm gonna pick one of the bond. Here I'm picking, picking the red bond, red bond. So, so the, the orbital configuration is slightly different for different bone directions, so I have to pick a one direction like this. So here, I'm thinking about a, a T2G orbital at this site, another T2G orbital at site two. Then there could be a, a all kinds of uh, hopping processes between the, you know, the D orbital is here, D orbital is there. And one way to characterize this is to think about uh, some kind of uh, uh, wave function overlap or orbital overlap. For example, uh, uh, I could have uh, direct iridium iridium orbital overlap. That's the way that the electrons may hope. Or I, I can also go through, uh, say, the oxygen orbital here. So I first go to the oxygen orbital and, and go to another D orbital, et cetera, et cetera. So this process, going from D orbital to P orbital of the oxygen and going to another D orbital, so this would be a, 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 what you may call a super exchange process, uh, and those guys correspond to the direct process, meaning it comes from a direct overlap of D orbital. So the point is, uh, if you have, uh, say, 3D transition metal oxide, if you're dealing with a 3D orbital, and then typically this is the dominating process, meaning oxygen-mediated hoping is usually dominating. The reason is that the D orbital, the size of the D orbital is so much smaller, but by the time you go to a 4D or 5D element, the D orbital size is big. So it turns out that uh, the direct overlap is, is as, as, as strong as the indirect, indirect uh, overlap like this. So you actually have to take into account all of these processes. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, using uh, all these uh, processes, we can construct the hoping matrix element. And, and the, all the hoping matrix element consist of either a super exchange like amplitude or, the, or it comes from a direct overlap. Then notice that 
if I only had a super exchange like process, say, uh, hopping through the oxygen, then I only have uh, uh, this type of uh, hopping amplitude. Uh, those guys will be absent. Okay. Good. So uh, this is an inherently multi orbital system. So even though I'm thinking about an effective J hop system, remember that there were actually J effective three hop state below. They are filled out. But, but when, I'm, when, I'm doing a, when I'm deriving a spin exchange model, then I have to do second order perturbation theory. Remember that when you do the second order perturbation theory, you have to take into account all the excited state as an intermediate state. So in order to take into account all the excited state, I cannot just restrict myself to the J effective half manifold. I have to worry about what happens to those J effective three half manifold. So I have to actually worry about all five orbital. That's why I ha have to write down a, some kind of multi-orbital Hubbard model. So here, it's a simplified version of that. This is called Kanamori Hamiltonian. So there's Hubbard U, screen Coulomb interaction, JH is Huns coupling, uh, and, and then S is the total spin quantum number, and it's the total angular momentum quantum number of each atom. So this is the Kanamori Hamiltonian for two atoms. And then you use the hoping process, the perturbation, to this type of interaction term. So this is the interaction term. This is the hopping term. So you do the second order perturbation theory. And you want to derive a model in terms of j effective half spin, j effective half degree of freedom. But at intermediate, as an intermediate step, so that's what I mean by n state, these are excited state. And in order to take into this account, you have to actually worry about configuration, you know, what happens to the uh, electrons in the J equal three half manifold. For example, I can, I can dig a hole in the J effective half, three half manifold and, and move that particle to the J effective half, half band, and things, half, half level and things like that. So those are all possible excited state. So when you do all that, uh, then you arrive at model, but now imagine that initially I didn't worry about direct overlap between the, the, the orbital and imagine that I only had a super exchange process like that. So, so, uh, so this just represents the hopping between P orbital and D orbital square. And delta PD is the energy level difference between P orbital, P orbital and D orbital. If you do that, then you, then you only get a guitar interaction. So if you only have oxygen mediated hopping, then, then you only have a guitar term. So that will be an ideal situation. But unfortunately, uh, other processes are as, e e as important as this process. So if you include all the direct overlap between D orbital, so this DD pi, DD delta, you don't have to know exactly what they are. They represent the direct overlap of D orbital. And those guys basically arise. And because of that, you're not just getting a K, the guitar interaction. You also get other kinds of interaction term, other kinds of interaction term. Yeah? So, 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 I mean, in principle, this tells us uh, how we may get a, a, a say pure guitar interaction. Basically, one way to get there is to suppress all the direct overlap. If the super exchange like process is dominating, then in principle, I can go to the regime where the K is dominating. That's essentially what, what, what you'd want. But uh, practically, this. It turns out that there's hard. The reason why it's hard is as follows. So, so uh, from the first place, in order to write down a model like this, I have to use this J effective half degree of freedom. And that was obtained by taking a large spin orbit coupling level. And, but typically, large spin orbit coupling is obtained when your, 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 your local moment element is heavy. The heavy elements usually has a larger spin orbit coupling. But usually the heavy elements has a larger orbital. So, so if, you know, if you try to achieve a large spin orbit coupling, typically uh, the outer shell D orbital is big, so that it's very difficult to avoid this uh, relatively large over direct overlap. So that's why, that's why it's so difficult to achieve a pure guitar model. So that's one thing that you, have, uh, you should have in mind. Okay. Okay, so uh, you will hear more about this from uh, Hide Takagi tomorrow, but uh, here is the sort of uh, summary of where we are in terms of 
uh, the discovery of uh, uh, guitar quantum spin liquid. So this is the example of 2D honeycomb system. So these are all layered materials. Uh, the iridium basically makes a honeycomb lattice. This is quite special. This is pretty recent. Uh, the Hide Takagi's group uh, took this material and they managed to replace some of the lithium by hydrogen. And it turns out that, that this material, uh, without doing anything, uh, does not show any magnetic order. And this is also another interesting material called alpha ruthenium chloride. Here, ruthenium is actually a 4D element, not a 5D element. But nonetheless, this material shows some characteristics of this J effective half degree of freedom. And there are also three dimensional versions of this. But, but the important thing is that most of this material actually order magnetically. So, this, that, and this material, all three order magnetically. Only this new material doesn't order. And this three dimensional material also order magnetically with a very complex uh, incommensurate spiral order. So now uh, the game is to find out how you may suppress the magnetic order so that you may be able to reach the, some kind of putative quantum spin liquid state. For example, uh, for this material, uh, this, this hydrogen substitution was used for ruthenium chloride 3. People apply uh, some kind of in-plane magnetic field. It turns out that if you apply a magnetic field, you can suppress the magnetic order. Uh, for those materials, uh, there are some pressure experiments. When you apply a, a pressure on this system, it turns out that you could suppress the magnetic order. So the question is, what happens after that? So you, you, lo you, you lose your magnetic order, but you still have to characterize uh, what the ground zero elementary excitations are. Okay. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, mostly theoretical ideas about this three-dimensional uh, honeycomb lattice. So uh, it's called, it's called hyperhoneycomb lattice. So there are two kinds of um, three-dimensional system here. Again, I'm showing you the uh, lattice of the iridium ions. So, so uh, each, each iridium ion is connected to three other iridium ions. But in this structure, uh, for, this is called beta polymorph, gamma polymorph. In the beta polymorph, you don't find any hexagon here. Yeah? So maybe calling that honeycomb uh, is a misnomer, but you know, that's why it's called hyperhoneycomb. Right? You're, beyond the, be, you're beyond the honeycomb structure. So, 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 but local connectivity is the same. And for the gamma polymorph, you do have a hexagon, but notice that this is not a layered uh, honeycomb structure. This, this honeycomb plane is alternating, and it's arranged the three-dimensional structure. And they also, you know, both of them order magnetically. And in both cases, the iridium ions are surrounded by edge-sharing octahedra, just like a 2D honeycomb system. Okay, so you may wonder what happens to the guitar model on these lattices. So, so I, I told you the guitar absorbed this model in two-dimensional honeycomb lattice, right? So you can do the same. Everything will be the same. Everything will be the same. The only difference is that now these C minor fermions are living on a three-dimensional lattice. And it, it, and it turns out that uh, if you solve this model, remember that for 2D honeycomb lattice, you get a Dirac spectrum, just like a graphene structure. It, for three-dimensional system, uh, it turns out that this minor fermion has a nodal line spectrum. Nodal line spectrum. And interestingly, in all of these cases, uh, heat capacity uh, coming from those minor fermion uh, should be given by temperature square, T square, if you discover this. Yeah, if you discover this. Um, so, in fact, you can think about all sorts of um, related structures. So, you start from a hyper honeycomb. You, there, there's no hexagon. For stripey honeycomb, there's a one hexagon uh, layers. And you can have two of those guys and three of those guys. And eventually, you may reach the completely layered structure, like a 2D honeycomb system. So in all of these cases, you can solve guitar model exactly. The exact solution exists for all of these lattices, OK? All, all these lattices. And in all of these cases, the Hamiltonian for C fermion has this structure. So diagonal matrix element is 0, but only the orthogonal matrix element is finite, OK? And it turns out that this structure of the Hamiltonian uh, is intimately related to uh, the solution of the Kitai model. In fact, there's a certain symmetry. Uh, in, you know, so I'm not going to go into details. So, you know, just uh, 
Some people call that BD1 class. Maybe it doesn't mean to you. So it doesn't mean anything to you. So it doesn't really matter how you call it. There are certain symmetries uh, uh, coming from the Hamiltonian. So important thing is that if you have a structure like this, it's pretty clear that in order to get a zero energy spectrum, I have to require that both real and imaginary part of determinant of D has to be zero. Only then I get a zero energy eigenvalue of such an such an Hamil, such an Hamiltonian. So if, if it's not clear to you, you can go home and do it in two seconds. Okay. So what happens is as follows. So in, 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 two, in two dimension, uh, one of these conditions will give you a circle. That's the, you know, the circle in brilliant zone uh, will give you zero energy, zero, satisfy this condition. The imaginary part will give you another circle. In order to have uh, both of them to be zero, you have basically, uh, you know, this, whenever these two circles meet, that's the solution, right? So that's why you get a Dirac point. In three dimension, each, each condition will give you surface of the sphere. There's another surface of sphere. Two surfaces of sphere intersect, you get a nodal line. That's why the solution is a nodal line spectrum. Yeah? And again, the density of state goes to zero in the low energy limit. So, so by the time you get to there, get there, uh, such a spin liquid is actually quite robust. It's, it's robust against a small perturbation. So it's a good thing. Okay. And, and this kind of uh, a system uh, is also characterized by some kind of topological invariant. So here I'm showing you the, uh, the nodal line spectrum. This is actually the zero energy contour in the three-dimensional brilliant zone. And if you, if you uh, take a loop, loop around, the, around this zero energy contour in a momentum space and take this combination and do the integral over all this line, then you can show that this becomes uh, some kind of integer topological invariant. Actually, that's, that's one way to characterize um, such a phase. So you can think of that as a, some kind of spin-on semi-metal. So there is an ordinary fermion uh, version of this. It's called topological semi-metal. This is like a spin-liquid version of that. Spin-liquid version of that. So it's, it, yeah. So and another interesting uh, aspect of this, uh, the guitar spin-liquid solution is that is that now I can uh, deform this contour in momentum space around the ring to a one-dimensional contour. Think about a closed contour, but going from you know, minus infinity to plus infinity, going all the way and come back. I can deform that. I can deform that line. So it turns out that if you evaluate this integral along this line, say, within the ring, then uh, you can show that this one-dimensional system you just take the momentum position along this line and think about that as a one-dimensional system. And that one-dimensional system is non-trivial. Uh, but the other one-dimensional system is trivial in the sense that if you evaluate this invariant, this is one, this is zero. So practically what that means is that for this trajectory, since, since this system is non-trivial, there is an interesting boundary state if you, if you have an open boundary. But for this direction, even if I have an open boundary, there is no interesting edge state, just like a topological insulator. So in fact, because of this, if you go to a surface, if you go to the surface or the open boundary of the system, then one can show that depending on the direction, so if you think about the projection of this ring to the surface brilliant zone, then within, within uh, uh, this, this circle, that's the projection of this ring to the surface brilliant zone, then you get a, a, a large number of zero energy mode. And you get actually flat spectrum. The spectrum is flat, but you have a large number of zero mode within the, within the circle. And, and depending on the uh, open boundary direction, it may look slightly differently. So you get an interesting boundary state. So, so here, you know, of course, bulk is interesting, but boundary is also interesting. Uh, so, so this is three dimensional guitar solution has this interesting property. I don't know whether we can use that ever, but, but it's good to have in mind, okay. So I told you that for this three-dimensional system, uh, there was a magnetic order. So experimentalists found a very complex incommensurate magnetic order, and we can explain this by using this model that we wrote down. 
Yep. Uh, for yeah, so for the surface, you you do have uh, you do have uh, uh, huge density of state. Huge density of state. So in fact, interesting possibility is that bulk is stable to the short, you know, the small perturbation, but the surface may not be stable because of that. So it's possible that you know you may get an interesting uh, instability at the boundary if you if you add some other interactions. So experimentally, uh, uh, the material order magnetically. You don't find the uh, um, key type spin like here. So okay. So so you may then you may say I forget it. But the life is not that simple, right? It's, life is supposed to be more interesting. So first of all, we can actually explain this just by looking at the classical model. It turns out that the material actually has a very large key type interaction. That's a good thing. But bad thing was uh, this additional interaction is. Is, is as equally large. And the magnitude of these two couplings are actually comparable. And because of that, you just get a magnetically ordered magnet state. Yeah. So, and, but good news is that uh, Hide Takagi's group applied a large pressure, hydrostatic pressure, and they managed to make this uh, magnetic order disappear. Yeah, he's a magician, you know? So, <laughs> so, so you will hear about that. You will hear about that. So after hearing about the ex experiment, uh, we, we, we went back to our steam model and tried to see how those uh, Kitaev and gamma interaction may change under hydrostatic pressure. So you can investigate this using, say, some kind of electronic structure calculation. Then what we found is that your Kitaev interaction, this K, K, is, K, K is the Kitaev interaction, Kitaev interaction generally becomes weaker. So you may think that there's a bad sign because I'm making Kitaev interaction smaller and smaller. But you are actually making gamma interaction larger and larger. Yeah, larger and larger. So what is interesting is that if you take a spin model where we are, now I have only gamma interaction, only gamma interaction, it turns out that that model is also highly frustrating. So classically, again, you end up with exponential large number of equally unhappy classical spin configuration. So it is possible that even that limit uh, may possess an interesting spin liquid state. We, we don't know. We, this model, uh, we cannot solve exactly. So, and, I, and, and I'm not as smart as Kitaev, so I cannot solve it. So, so what happens is that, uh, remember how we derive the spin model? And in order to uh, derive that, I used all the hopping processes. And hopping processes were expressed as an overlap integral of so orbital. That's right. You change the hopping amplitude. Then, then, then using the same exercise, I can derive the spin model. Then all the exchange parameter will be changed under pressure. That's the way that it is estimated. Yeah. OK. So uh, let me see, how much time do I have? Huh? About five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Question? Yeah. So I, the, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, he's asking whether, whether I expect to see a, a new spin liquid uh, when guitar interaction is almost, almost disappearing or somewhere in the middle. I wish I know that answer. I, do, I don't know the answer. Yeah, question? Three-dimensional lattice. Yes. Yeah. And they got That's right. But classical spin link really means you end up with an exponentially large number of equally unhappy spin configuration. Okay. And it doesn't order into any particular magnetic order state, even if you decrease your temperature. Now, what happens for the quantum model, we don't know. Nobody was able to solve that. You can solve a classical model. 
and confirm that there is no magnetic order down to very low temperature. But we don't know what happens to quantum model. That's essentially what you want to know. Okay. So since I don't have a lot of time, I just want to mention, I, I want to briefly mention uh, the connection to. Uh, I have more time? Huh? Like 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, okay. Yeah. But maybe. May, huh? How much time do I have? Oh, well, okay. I have a lot of time there. Okay, good. No, I want to use it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So, another interesting material is this alpha lucidium chloride 3. So, um, I don't know how much Hide is going to talk, talk about this. Are you going to talk about this too? Only two slides, okay. So, um, this, so this material is also an uh, interesting uh, candidate system for the uh, spin liquid. And the point is that lutetium 3 plus in this system is also D5 configuration, even though it's a 4D, not 5D. So you can, in principle, use the same kind of picture. You may say that this lutetium 3 plus ion may also carry this effective spin half. In that case, uh, since lutetium 3 plus are sitting on a honeycomb lattice, uh, you may expect to see a guitar spin liquid physics. But again, this material also order magnetically with a zigzag order, just like any other honeycomb iride. But, uh, but there was this very interesting set of experiment claiming that they can see uh, something more than the, the magnon in the magnetic order state. They somehow see a continuum of excitations here. And the idea is something like this. So this is the neutron scattering uh, intensity as a function of energy. And these two peaks are supposed to represent the magnon excitations, you know, ordered magnetic state, the zigzag order. But on top of that, they somehow see a, a broad continuum of excitation. And when they increase the temperature above the narrow ordering temperature, so narrow ordering temperature like a 7 Kelvin, uh, then the magnon disappears, of course, but uh, this continuum still stays. So, so the, the interesting idea was, well, imagine that, imagine that this continuum comes from some kind of underlying spin liquid. So if you had uh, some, some spin liquid, then in the neutron scattering, if you are measuring a spin flip process, right? Neutron measures spin on excitation. So magnons, magnons are spin on excitation, for example. But if spin on, spin, but spin ons are usually, they, they usually carry spin half quantum number. So in order to create a spin one object, you have to excite two of them. So you have to excite spin on and this spin on pair excitations to generate spin on excitations. And this pair excitation, just like a particle hole continuum in metals, they will give you some kind of continuum. And the dispersion of the spin on essentially determines what the dispersion of the bottom of the continuum looks like. So, so this will be a generic, generic expectation. There's some kind of threshold energy for pair excitation, but that threshold energy has some two-dimensional dispersion. So that's what you may want to see. Uh, so, there just, so there was a suggestion that this continuum may be something like that. So that, that's, that's, that's one idea. But then uh, the question is why then, in this case, continuum coexist with the, the, the magnetic order? You know, does it mean that the spin liquid coexists with the magnetic order? That sounds weird, right? So some people propose that perhaps there is some unknown coupling constant here that uh, you are in the zigzag order state, but this zigzag order is kind of weak, and maybe it's about to be uh, uh, destroyed what we destroy. And then, then uh, the finite temperature property here may look like the property of the spin liquid. In fact, it turns out that for the Kitayev spin liquid, uh, there is no finite temperature transition. 
So the, the guitar is spinning the ground state. If you heat up the system, there is no finite temperature transition. So it's only a crossover. So you may expect to see that, well, you know, if the spin liquid state is very powerful, then you may see some, some signatures of that. Yeah? Question? Good question. There is no theory. It's a speculation at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose you are a theorist? Yeah, so, so you're welcome to work it out. Okay, good. Uh, another, another, interesting, uh, another interesting discovery was that when they did look at the momentum dependence of this continuum, they see this uh, interesting star shape dispersed in a two-dimensional Boolean zone uh, in the low energy regime. And they don't quite see that in the high energy regime, but they see this. And the reason why this may be important is that if you solve a um, pure guitar model, uh, you don't see this structure in the dynamical structure factor. So, 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 so it's clear that uh, if this is the signature of the spin liquid, we know, we know the underlying Hamiltonian is not a pure guitar model, something else. So that much we know. Okay. So, uh, but then very recently, people managed to suppress the magnetic order by applying an in-plane magnetic field like uh, a Tesla, then the zigzag magnetic will disappear. Uh, so then obviously you will get into a, a, some kind of a paramagnetic state. And, and most boring scenario will be you immediately go to a fully polarized paramagnet. You destroy the magnetic order, all the spins are polarized because you apply a magnetic field after all. They're all polarized. Then you have a transition from boring magnetic order state to boring paramagnet. That's it, right? Very boring scenario. But, what is, but, but it turns out that um, uh, uh, the, the, the experimentalists in Japan, the Kyoto University, is led by Yuji Machuda, they measure the thermal hole conductivity around this area before you reach the fully polarized paramagnet. And he, they found that for a range of magnetic field, which is window is actually quite small, but they found this almost constant quantized they call quantized value of the thermal hole conductivity. And the reason why this is interesting is that, uh, yeah, so somewhere before you, you know, before you reach the polarized state, uh, the reason why it's interesting is that according to guitar, if you take a pure guitar model and apply a strong magnetic field, then you can get into a different kind of spin liquid state. There's tiny muscle symmetry breaking spin liquid state. That the bulk, bulk is gap. Your myelin excitation acquires a mass, it, but you get an interesting boundary state, just like integer quantum state. And this boundary state is some, some kind of myelin or chiral mode. And that will give you quantized kappa xy. And, and it's quantized in the sense that you know, the unit of uh, kappa xy 2D is kb squared by h bar. So if you said, if you use the, what people call convenient unit, meaning every, every constant equals to one, then it it should, it should be given by uh, pi by 12. Uh, so, so Kitab emphasized that this coefficient here has to be half because for the integer quantum state, it actually has to be pi by 6 because the edge current is carried by usual fermion. But here, because of the fact that boundary fermions are myelinous, uh, the, the, the coefficient has to, actually has to be half. It's just that number of degree of freedom basically is half. Remember that I can make a one ordinary fermion by combining two Majorana fermions. So, so, you know, you can say Majorana fermion is half of the ordinary fermion. So that's why the coefficient is half. And you can also see that uh, a finite temperature, uh, a finite temperature, if you go to low temperature, you actually reach this quantized value. So this is theoretical calculation of the pure guitar model. So you should reach the pi by 12. So the claim in the experiment is that they see that. Claiming the experiment is that they see pi by 12. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I think some people don't believe it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but that's, that's, basically the, that's basically the data. Okay. So then, then the question is, OK, you know, uh, then what's really the model for this, this material? Uh, 
So there was a serious uh, initial computations from uh, various different groups. And I think that most of them uh, converge to a model like this. It's, you know, they don't precisely agree, but uh, roughly this is kind of the model that people end up with. So you do have a guitar interaction. You also have this gamma interaction that I told you about. There's also a Heisenberg interaction, but it turns out that the third neighbor Heisenberg interaction is the largest instead of the nearest neighbor. Uh, you may think that this is weird. <laughs> usually, usually, nearest neighbor has to be the biggest. But the reason why third neighbor, um, in this case, is, turns out to be big, is number of exchange paths for the third neighbor is actually larger. So this is a competition, right? Of course, for the individual exchange path, nearest neighbor is, of course, dominating, has to be biggest. But you have to multiply that by the number of exchange paths. So when you work out all the details, it turns out the third neighbor uh, somehow is the biggest uh, for, this, for this system. But you could keep both third neighbor and nearest neighbor. Actually, it turns out it doesn't make a huge difference. But the important thing is the largest coupling is not this J. Largest coupling is K and gamma. But you cannot ignore gamma term. Both of them are very strong. Both of them are very strong. And we, and we know the sign. The ferro, ferro like guitar and uh, anti ferro like gamma interaction. So, so okay. So now, fr from now on, is, so I'm going to be a little bit biased because I have to present uh, uh, my own research result. So, so far, I have been trying to be very objective, but now I'm becoming a little bit more subjective. Yeah? You, there is a neutron scattering data in the field. Uh, and around, around that uh, critical field, yeah. uh, they, they do see a continuum, some kind of continuum showing up around the gamma point. But, but you know, normally, if you really reach the spin leaky state, you would expect to see that the continuum exists in different parts of the momentum space. But in their case, it's more or less concentrated near the gamma point. Uh, exactly, yeah. As, uh, yeah, just. Uh, uh, so uh, we don't know, yeah. I mean, there's. there's no, no, there something changes in between. But, but by the time you suppress the magnetic order, looks like that continuum, say, show, you know, shows up again. It's something like that, yeah. Okay, very, very high field, yeah, all polarized. Should it be there, yeah. So what the system to go? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that some kind of multi-megaron bounds they should condense below the, below the single megaron. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then there are so many possibilities. You can, you can have like demetic order and yeah. Okay, so one thing we tried to do was uh, since K and gamma is the largest energy scale in this problem, why don't we just start from a K gamma model? It's a natural thing to do, isn't it? So I take a K gamma model. Just, you, you just keep K and gamma. But in order to make the story a little more interesting, we make guitar coupling along X and y, X, Y, and Z bond to be slightly different. So I, I give out some uh, an isotropy here. So when they are completely isotropic along this line, we found that uh, there's a force of the transition from guitar spin liquid. So this is the guitar limit. This is the gamma limit. So the pure guitar, pure gamma. We found that we, 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 we didn't find any obvious magnetic order in the entire line, but there was a force of transition from one state to the other. Yeah. We know that this guy has to be a guitar spin liquid because this one is continuously connected to the pure guitar limit. Uh, we don't know what this guy is. And it's separated by force of transition. But 
What is interesting is that when we introduce anisotropy, this phosphor transition line actually terminates somewhere. It looks as if I could go around this point from here to here. That's the numerical result. Okay. So, you know, the, and this was done by some kind of exact diagonalization and uh, you know, densitymetric linearization group computation. So the question is, what's the nature of this phase here? You know, is it really uh, distinct from guitar spin liquid, or maybe there's a possibility that this some kind of paramagnetic state exists here, and there's some that has some character of uh, guitar spin liquid. And another interesting thing is that if you take just this model, simple model, K gamma model, and compute the uh, dynamical structure factor, uh, you do find uh, the star shape dynamical structure factor, as seen in the experiment. So there must be some truth in that model. Now, if you add a, a J3, uh, if you add a J3, indeed, indeed you, you go into a zigzag magnetic order. So the model actually has, has some, some uh, correct characteristics that you, know, you, you, could, you could go into a, a, a magnetic, zigzag magnetic order state by adding J3. And if you don't have it, then it uh, looks like you get some kind of quantum paramount. Okay, so here is the speculative picture of, of, of uh, many people, not just me. So imagine that alpha ruthenium chloride 3 is somewhere here, and there's some uh, control parameter. In this case, I'm using third neighbor J. Yeah, so here, then I'm applying a magnetic field. Uh, then uh, perhaps what happens is that my magnetic order is suppressed, so I, you know, in an ideal world, I may get into a chiral spin liquid state. Then eventually, I go to polarized paramagnet. Okay, so there's no, you know, there's no um, computation here. This is just a speculative phase diagram. So this is one possibility. If you truly believe uh, Yuji Machuda's thermal hole conductivity data, then this could be a one possibility. So in Kitaev spin liquid, when you apply a magnetic field, you immediately become a chiral spin liquid. Yeah. Here, of course, we don't know. Yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this. So uh, maybe in the last five minutes, uh, I just want to briefly mention uh, that now uh, one interesting. Work that we have done recently is that we, we ask this question, what happens to a guitar spin liquid when you couple that to an itinerary electron? So think about a Condolaris-like problem. So imagine that, imagine that I have a, some kind of heavy fermion system. Local moments are sitting on a honeycomb lattice. They interact with each other in terms of guitar interaction so that if I only have a local moment, they form a guitar spin liquid. Now I add a conduction electron using the usual condor coupling. What happens then? In the ordinary condor problem, when I add a conduction electron, there's some kind of condor screening, I get into a heavy Fermi liquid state. Now, that's the usual scenario of, um, you know, that's what you find in a textbook. So now here, what happens uh, is as follows. Uh, so just, I'd like to remind you that we could rewrite Kitai model uh, in this form the PCS form. So, you know, basic claim was that uh, Kitab spin liquid is a failed superconductor. Yeah? Almost superconductor, but, it, but failed to do so. Yeah? So now I take this, so, it, you know, some kind of project is spin triple superconductor. Now I couple this guy to a conduction electron, uh, and, and I use the, uh, the textbook uh, slave particle representation of the spin operator, and I basically repeat the same exercise. Um, so, but it's just, it just that uh, one technical remark is that since this model doesn't have a spin rotation symmetry, it turns out that uh, this is to the expert. Uh, when you decouple this condo interaction in many different hybridization channels, uh, essentially you have to include all possible singlet and triplet channels. So, so, so this is, we have done that. So this is the result. So what is interesting 
is that uh, uh, when, the kit, when the conduct coupling is very, very small, the small conduct coupling is the irrelevant perturbation, again, to the spin liquid, mainly because the, the density of state of uh, Mariana fermions in the guitar spin liquid state goes to zero in the zero, zero energy limit. And because of that, any short range interaction added to that system is a irrelevant perturbation. Essentially, for small guitar coupling, the guitar spin liquid and your ideal electron, they happily coexist. They don't want to mix. Okay? So that state persists for a while. So you may call that uh, using Centil's nomenclature, you may say the formulaic star phase. Okay? But eventually something happens. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, you get a superconductor. And this is not an ordinary superconductor. We found that you actually end up with a topological superconductor. And it spontaneously breaks uh, tiny bosa symmetry, it becomes a ferromagnetic topological superconductor. And in this superconductor, uh, the bulk is gap, but the boundary uh, has a chiral minor for you. And you can sort of understand why you, you obtain such a strange superconducting state here. If you remember, or if you know, that if I apply a magnetic field to the guitar spin liquid, I told you that it becomes a chiral spin liquid. And that state, I can, I can do the exact the same <coughs> internet transformation from Majoran representation to complex formula representation. Then again, I end up with the BCS like Hamiltonian. That Hamiltonian uh, is actually uh, some kind of topological superconductor Hamiltonian. It's just that I have to impose the constraint, the number of particles per side, exactly one. Now, by, by putting it in an electron, uh, now charge degree of freedom is now active, if you like. And because of that, the first thing the, the couple system wants to do is to take the advantage of that. To take the, take the advantage of the fact that uh, if you break tiny muscle in the guitar spin liquid, it was almost topological superconductor. So by the time you couple this thing to a conduction electron, it immediately wants to be there. Now, difference between uh, the chiral spin liquid and this guy is that this guy now is a true superconductor. It's not a spin liquid. It's not an insulator. Now it's a superconductor. Your superconductivity is, in a way, liberated by coupling this thing to a conduction electron. So if you have this, then you have a boundary chiral minor fermion. And for this state, indeed, kappa xy has to be quantized. And interestingly, if you increase the conduct coupling further, then uh, you suppress this uh, ferromagnetic order. It becomes a paramagnetic superconductor. Uh, it turns out that this state is also topological. It just belongs to a different class. Uh, in, in this case, there are two uh, counter-propagating edge mode, not just one. It's not chiral anymore because you have a tiny muscle symmetry back. So one of them moving in a circular direction, the other guy moving in an anti, anti circular direction, clockwise and anti-clockwise direction. So this is essentially the solution uh, we obtain. Uh, so you can, you know, if you're interested, you can probably see the different uh, reference. But what I'm, to, what I'm trying to um, emphasize here is that this, this is perhaps a, a, a new, new route to the topological superconductor. So, so, so this route has not been explored. Basically, using the conduct coupling, try to get a topological superconductor. Question? OK, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm basically done. So, so I just wanted to show you this slide because I think it's interesting. And, and, and this may be a new route to uh, get into a topological superconductor. Pardon? This is, oh, this is the plain uh, slave particle mean field theory that you will do with any condolaris model. Yeah. I mean, you cannot solve it using like quantum Monte Carlo because sign power. So at, at the moment, the, the only thing that we have is this uh, slave particle mean field theory. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I, I like to end my lecture with that, right? Thank you very much.